Nearly two weeks ago, our nation experienced what some people described as evil. And that word might be truer than people realize. In Ephesians 6, Paul famously writes these words, and this is from the King James Version. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, when Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, he's writing to people who know only too well of armies and emperors who are made of flesh and blood and who were able and had, in fact, destroyed their flesh and drawn their blood. So it is interesting that he says that this fight that they are in is not against flesh and blood. Can I read you more of that passage? But this time I want to read from N.T. Wright's translation. And as I read it to you, I want to ask that you don't think as much about Ephesus or Rome, but just keep South Africa in the back of your mind. So Paul says, what else is there to say? Just this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on God's complete armor. Then you'll be able to stand firm against the devil's trickery. The warfare we're engaged in, you see, isn't against flesh and blood. It's against the leaders, against the authorities, against the powers that rule the world in this dark age. Against the wicked spiritual elements in the heavenly places. And for this reason, you must take up God's complete armor. Then when wickedness grabs its moment, you'll be able to withstand to do what needs to be done and still to be on your feet when it's all over. So stand firm. And if you don't mind, I just want to read you the latter section of that from Eugene Peterson's The Message. He says, this is no weekend war we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. So today, we begin a short sermon series on spiritual warfare. And part of what I hope to do in this time is I want to dispel some of the myths about it. But more than that, I want us to discover deep and great encouragement for us in a season of difficult uh, challenges. We want to find out how we can stand firm in the midst of what Paul describes as a dangerous and evil world. So firstly to say, the phrase spiritual warfare doesn't occur like that in scripture. It's a phrase which has emerged largely uh, as people have worked with uh, this passage of scripture we read today. Paul's description of the devil's trickery and our need to guard against it and the imagery he uses of a Roman soldier, all of these things gave birth to this language of spiritual warfare. But it is a phrase with which uh, I am certain we need to be very careful. Because on the one hand, there are those who live uh, in the light of a passage like this. They live with a siege mentality. Uh, followers of Jesus who live with a siege mentality. They live always at war with someone. They're convinced that someone's out to get them. It's often a way of thinking in which we define ourselves largely by what we're against than what we're for. And people who think like this often think with or live with a kind of spiritual paranoia. Uh, I know this isn't true of everyone, but, but there are those who, who think that demons are everywhere or those who think that every interpersonal disagreement is some kind of satanic attack, uh, or any trouble that comes our way, whether it's a serious thing like losing your job, or whether you didn't make it to the woolly sale on time, people have this sense of kind of going, I'm in the midst of spiritual warfare. And the same kind of, and I know it's a generalization, but the same group of people often have quite dramatic vocabulary. They, they cast down and cast out and they come against and they rebuke and they claim and they cover and they agree and so on and so forth in the midst of all of these things. And by the way, it's not uncommon for people who have this kind of siege mentality to resort to some actual kind of violence in the name of Jesus. If you look carefully at world politics in the last uh, even just four or five years, you will see witness to that. And then there's another group of people 
who don't like the sound of all of that kind of stuff. It all seems a little strange for them. So they largely end up, I think, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And they kind of just muddle along, not really paying attention to this passage of Scripture, not paying attention to Paul's words about the work of evil in this world and how dangerous our world can be, both for us, but not only for us, but how dangerous this world can be because of us. And, and if I can dare to say, I think you'll find out of those two groups, we Methodists probably fall more in the latter group than the former. And Paul didn't intend either of these things for us to think out of this writing. Paul is teaching us that we don't need to be spiritually defensive or offensive in the way we behave. We don't need to be aggressive in the way we express our faith. This isn't a license for us to go to war. Uh, and it equally is not a license for us to be passive. Uh, if anything, it's the opposite of that. It's a call for us to do something. But what he wants us to do is he wants to teach us how to be strong. It's an important word, how to be strong in the power of the Lord. He wants us to learn how to stand firm in the midst of adversary. It's not a call to theatrics. It's not a call to any great drama. It's actually this beautifully simple call for the followers of Jesus to learn in the midst of great struggle to be strong and to stand firm. Now let me say that there is evil in our world which is obvious. It's made of, to use Paul's words, it's made of flesh and blood. We can see it. It's not hard to identify. Uh, when on the one hand we are familiar with that picture, and they've been around for decades, but the picture of a starving child uh, in one part of the world. Uh, and I'm not going to put an image up here on the screen today because because we know those pictures too well. But on the one hand, we, we know the picture of a starving child. And then on the other hand, in another part of the world, we can see the picture of, of someone engaged in a hot dog eating contest, stuffing their face with as much food as they can in as short a space of time as they are able. And when we look at either of those pictures, the starving child or the man stuffing his face, we know instinctively that there's something wrong with both of those pictures. But when you put those pictures together, when you think of those two images together, it then becomes insidious. It becomes evil. That there can be a starving child and a man stuffing his face for fun. When Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he doesn't mean that we should just ignore the obvious evil, the evil we can see. It's just that he knows that our strength, our ability to stand, our capacity to be strong will come not simply by resisting the evil we can see, but it will be by paying attention to the evil we cannot see, the, the evil that is not as obvious. So for the Ephesians, it wasn't just the executions or the sanctions on food or the imprisonments which were a threat to them. They were up against much bigger things. They were up against uh, Roman greed, against a culture of violence, against racial prejudice, against religious persecution. They were struggling against the abuse of power. Uh, they battled discrimination against women and children, the undermining of fundamental human rights. And at the same time, they must have been wrestling with their own resentments and revenge and hatred and unforgiveness in their hearts as a result of the atrocities of the Romans. There are bigger things going on than what we can just see, than just the flesh and blood. Just by way as, as, of example, and you'll know this well, the question is never just about how we care for the poor. The burning question will always be, we have to ask why they are poor. The question is never just about what we can see. The battle is not only with flesh and blood, it's about what we cannot see that we need and that Paul wants us to notice in our passage today. I've learned very deeply in the past months that COVID is not only dangerous to our bodies, I, I have no doubt in my mind 
that COVID is proving to be dangerous to our souls. The tragic, tragic loss of life that people have experienced, some within our own community as a result of COVID, uh, deserves our attention and our compassion. But life has been, um, life has been affected by, by even more than that. Uh, we have been affected by despair and hopelessness, a lack of vision for the future, alienation from one another. And although there have been these signs of remarkable care that, ha that has emerged in this time, I also think we've seen an incredible selfishness in some people during this COVID time. And those kinds of things have made their way into our souls like never before. I sense it in myself. There, there, there have been things that have happened to my soul in this time that I don't think I've ever experienced in my life before. And Paul has a phrase for this. He calls it, in the one translation, I like it, he calls it the wiles of the devil. N.T. Wright calls it the devil's trickery. And Paul cautions the Ephesians to be careful of the devil's trickery, of that evil that doesn't look or feel like evil, of that evil which we end up embracing, perhaps inadvertently, or even that evil we take on, we choose for ourselves. Paul's warning the Ephesians about the subtle evil, the evil we end up knowing is evil, but we just don't resist it. It's a bit like that boiling frog thing or that evil which comes to us, somehow disguised as being right or righteous or good, and so we kind of buy into it. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, if Sharon and I uh, ever feel like we deserve a treat, if we ever feel like it's a celebration and we're going to have a special meal, or sometimes even if we feel like we've been through a particularly rough season and we want to spoil ourselves, then I go to the butcher and I buy some lamb knuckles and I cook us a, a lamb curry. And, and there's no one else here to say it, but let me just tell you, the lamb curry I make, it's fantastic. Fantastic. Anyway, moving on. So we, we've watched, we've recently watched this TV show called Clarkson's Farm. Uh, and he's a well-known motoring journalist, as some of you will know, and he decides to try his hand at farming, and they went and made a TV show out of it. And in the show, we follow, amongst other things, we follow the pregnancies of about 70 sheep. And we witness the precarious nature of, of lambing season, where a shepherd comes and the vet comes, and even Clarkson himself, and they care for these newly born lambs uh, and to make sure that they survive the first difficult days of life. And then a, a couple of episodes later, much to our horror, uh, the lambs all get sent to the abattoir to become Sunday lunch for us. It's, it's easy to eat lamb curry if you just don't think about where lambs come from. It's easy to eat lamb curry, even worse, if you don't care about where lambs come from. It's easy for us to choose to ignore or not care about the evil that goes on in our world. It's called the wiles of the devil, the trickery of the devil. Now, those who study these things tell us that one of the reasons evil prospers in groups and gatherings and organizations is because those contexts provide anonymity for us. It removes us from a direct sense of responsibility. So we can be involved with evil without having to feel any guilt. We can eat lamb curry without having to worry about where the lambs come from. So we saw this happening in our nation nearly two weeks ago, as we've said. We saw people who the day before would never have imagined themselves to be thieves. And yet now they are. They are criminals. As some of a random example, I don't know if you know this, but in South Africa, if you're a woman, you can earn up to 35% less than a man for doing the exact same job. And we've got to ask ourselves the question, how is this possible? It's 2021. How in this world can that prejudice still be present? And the answer is simple. It's because 
at least 30% of the businesses in our country still find it acceptable to pay women less than men for doing the exact same work. It's an evil we know about. It's an evil we simply allow. It sits there. And it's hard for us to acknowledge that in the world in which we live, that these things are going on all the time. Behind all that vandalism and criminality and hooliganism and thuggery that we witnessed in our country, there is also an evil that we don't want to see. There's an evil we don't want to acknowledge. And it's in fact an evil from which most of us benefit. And it's an evil which some of us in fact actively support. It's an evil we'd rather not name because that makes it too uncomfortable for us. So it turns out that spiritual warfare has far less to do with shouting at invisible demons. And neither as followers of Jesus are we given the luxury of just ignoring Paul's words and doing nothing about a world in which evil is clearly present. Instead, Paul is inviting us to become particular kinds of people, a, a kind of person who is able to be strong and stand firm in the midst of all of the stuff that goes on, both seen and unseen in our world. So I hope you'll join us next week as we learn how to be and do more of that. Take care.